My name's Eliza. Growing up, the difference between me and my twin sister, Anna, was like night and day. She was the golden girl, and well, I wasn't. Our dad, a stern university professor, had his life's work tied up in books and lectures. While our mom was the quintessential housewife dedicated to her home and family, pushing us to follow in her footsteps. From as early as I can remember, being at home felt more like sitting through a never-ending critique session. My parents had a blueprint for the perfect family, and it didn't include a daughter who wore band t-shirts and liked to keep to herself. Eliza, why can't you be more like your sister? Was my mom's favorite line, usually tossed my way when I showed up at breakfast with my headphones in, trying to block out the world. Anna, on the other hand, basked in the glow of approval. I just don't get why it's so hard for you to put on a nice dress and smile more, she'd say, flipping her perfect hair over her shoulder. It was like she was from a different planet. One particularly grueling Saturday, as our family prepared for one of Dad's faculty parties. A total snooze fest but a mandatory appearance for us. I decided to rebel in the smallest way I knew how. I put on my darkest eyeliner and a pair of boots that definitely did not meet the appropriate standard. You're not going out like that, are you? Mom caught me on the stairs, her eyes darting down to my boots as if they were covered in mud. I shrugged, my standard defense. Don't see why not. She sighed that long, drawn-out kind that said I was the biggest disappointment in her perfectly ordered world. Please, Eliza, just this once, can't you try to fit in? What for? So you can pretend we're the perfect family? I shot back, tired of the same old song and dance. It's not about pretending. It's about showing respect for your father. She argued, her voice taking on that sharp tone that meant business. Anna, overhearing the exchange, came trotting down the hallway, her heels clicking on the hardwood like a judge approaching the bench. Mom's right, Liz. It's not that hard to look decent. Why do you always have to make things difficult? Maybe I don't want to be a clone of you, Anna. I snapped, feeling my face get hot. I hated these arguments, hated being compared, but more than anything, I hated feeling like the odd one out in my own home. Dad appeared at the bottom of the stairs, his brow furrowed. Enough, he commanded, his voice firm. Eliza, go change now, we're leaving in ten minutes. His tone left no room for argument. He didn't yell, he didn't need to. The disappointment in his eyes was enough to send me marching back to my room to swap my boots for bland flats and wipe away half my eyeliner. As we drove to the party, the car was silent except for the classical music Dad insisted on playing, because it was calming. I stared out the window, the trees blurring past. In that moment, I promised myself someday I'd live a life where no one could tell me what to wear, how to act, or who to be. Someday, I'd be free from the echo of these expectations. My room was the only corner of the house where I could pretend I was somewhere else, anywhere else. Unlike the rest of the house, which was filled with my parents' choices, my room was mine. It wasn't much, just four walls covered in sketches and music posters, but it was my escape from the reality of my family's expectations. One evening, as I was trying to lose myself in a playlist of my favorite bands, Dad knocked and marched into my room, his face set in a familiar frown. Eliza, turn that noise down. And why haven't you studied with Anna today? You know you both have exams coming up. He said, his voice stern. I pulled out one earbud and looked up at him, trying to keep my voice even. I've been studying, just not with Anna. I learn better on my own. Dad shook his head, clearly not buying it. You know the rules. Your sister gets good grades and you should be doing the same. I don't see why you always have to make things difficult. It's not about making things difficult, I said, my frustration growing. I just don't see why I have to follow Anna's way of doing everything. Can't I have my own way of studying? He didn't respond to that, just switched his complaint. 
And those friends of yours, I saw you with them at the cave yesterday. I don't think they're a good influence. You should be spending time with the daughters of my colleagues. They're more suitable. I felt my temper rise. Suitable for what? For you, because they talk about economics and pretend to enjoy those boring university gatherings. Before he could answer, Mom appeared at the doorway, her voice sharp as she joined in. Eliza, your father is right. Those girls are from good families. They know how to behave. They're the kind of friends you should want. I stood up, facing both of them. What if I don't want friends who are picked for me? What if I want to choose my own friends, choose what I study, or even what I want to be? That's enough, Eliza, Mom said, her tone final. You know your future is with the university. Your father has made sure of that. And after you graduate, you'll need to start thinking about settling down. We've already discussed this. Settling down. The words hung in the air like a lie sentence. You mean start thinking about being someone's wife like Anna. Is that all you think I'm meant for? Mom's face softened slightly, but her voice remained firm. We want what's best for you. Following the path we've set out will give you a good life. A good life, I repeated, the irony bitter in my mouth. Is it a good life if it's someone else's idea of good? No one answered that. They didn't need to. We all knew there was no point in arguing. They had their plans, and they expected me to fall in line, just like Anna. Anna and I were like two sides of the same coin, always together, but never on the same page. At the university, where Dad taught, the differences between us grew even more obvious. She was into business management, the golden child always nodding along in lectures, asking smart questions that made professors nod appreciatively. Me, I was stuck in the same program, but it felt like wearing a shoe on the wrong foot. Awkward, uncomfortable, and just plain wrong. One afternoon, as I trudged through a mountain of textbooks in the library, Anna breezed in, her notes organized, her smile ready. Hey Liz, you coming to the study group tonight? Professor Hall mentioned he's dropping by. Could be good for us to show face, she said her tone light but insistent. I glanced up, feeling the weight of her expectations. No, I don't think so. Those things aren't really my scene, you know. She frowned, placing her books down with a thud that matched her disapproval. It's not about it being your scene, Liz. It's about making the right impressions. You need to start taking this seriously. We're graduating soon. I shrugged, turning back to my notes. I am taking it seriously, just not in a way that makes me miserable. Why bother pretending? Because, Liz, sometimes you have to play the game to get ahead. You think I like all of this. She gestured around at her perfectly tabbed textbooks and color-coded notes. It's not about liking, it's about doing what's necessary. I shook my head, pushing back my chair with a scrape. Well, maybe I'm tired of doing what's necessary according to everyone else. Did you ever think of that? Her voice softened, but her eyes were steel. Liz, I'm just trying to look out for you. That's not going to be around to sort things out forever. What are you going to do if you keep alienating everyone? Maybe I'll figure it out on my own. Maybe I don't need to follow Dad's roadmap or yours. I shot back, feeling a surge of defiance. Anna sighed, her frustration clear. You're so stubborn. Just try, okay? For me, if not for yourself, show up tonight. Talk to Professor Hall. It won't kill you. I looked at her, really looked at her and saw not just my annoyingly perfect sister, but someone who actually cared in her own way. Fine, I'll think about it, I conceded, not ready to promise more. Thank you, she said, her smile returning. It's not that bad, you know. You might even like it if you gave it a chance. Dubbed it, I muttered, but I knew I'd lost this round. For Anna, I'd show up, sit through another boring discussion, and not at the right times. It was just a few hours, I told myself. 
How bad could it be? As it turned out, not as bad as I thought. Professor Hall was surprisingly interesting when he wasn't lecturing from a podium. I even asked a question, which earned a shocked but pleased look from Anna. Later, as we walked back to our dorm, Anna nudged me. See, not so terrible, right? That fragile piece didn't last long, however. In our last year, Anna introduced us to her fianche, a lawyer 10 years her senior, already well-established and exactly what our parents dreamed of. Mom and Dad were over the moon, praising Anna for making such a smart match and immediately turning their expectant eyes on me. Now, Eliza, it's your- After the wedding, Mom often visited Anna, doling out advice and ensuring her life played out just as she had orchestrated. Witnessing this, I knew one thing for certain. I didn't want my life tailored by someone else's hands. One day, I was walking down the street, lost in thoughts of how to escape the life my parents envisioned for me, when I heard the deep rumble of a motorcycle approaching. Curiosity pulled me toward the sound. That's when I saw him, Jake with his leather jacket and, and carefree smile, pulling up beside me. You look like you need a ride, he called over the roar of the engine, a playful twinkle in his eyes. I hesitated, glancing back toward the path home, then at his outstretched hand. What did I have to lose? Sure, why not? I replied, my voice a mix of nerves and excitement. Climbing onto the back of his bike, I felt a rush of adrenaline as we sped away. The wind whipped through my hair, and for the first time in a long time, I laughed, genuinely laughed. Jake shouted something about showing me his world, and I held on tighter, not wanting this moment to end. We stopped at a diner frequented by bikers. Over burgers and fries, Jake told me about his life as a welder his passion for bikes, and his love for the open road. It was so different from anything I was used to, raw and real. Don't you get scared living like this? I asked, my voice barely above the clatter of plates and chatter around us. Scared? No, it's thrilling. You never know what's around the corner. Isn't that better than having everything planned out for you? He replied, his eyes lighting up with each word. Over the next few weeks, we met secretly. Each ride on Jake's motorcycle pulled me further from the life I was supposed to live and closer to the life I wanted. The speed, the adventure, it wasn't just about the thrill. It was about feeling alive, feeling free. One evening, as we watched the sunset from a secluded overlook, Jake turned to me. Eliza, I don't just ride to escape. I ride to feel alive, to make every moment count. With you, every moment feels like it's worth something. I leaned into him, my heart beating fast. I've never felt like this before. You make me feel free, Jake. He smiled, pulling me closer. Then let's not go back to just existing. Let's live. Six months with Jake felt like a lifetime of moments I'd always dreamed of. The day he proposed under the stars with the gentle rumble of his bike in the background, my heart screamed a yes before my mouth could form the word. It was perfect, except for one looming hurdle, my parents. I wrestled with the fear of introducing Jake to them. He was everything they disapproved of, his rough edges, his wild spirit, his simple yet content life as a welder. But love bolstered my courage, and I decided it was time they knew. The day I brought Jake home, he was clad in his usual leather vest, black t-shirt, ripped jeans, and a bandana. I loved that about him. He was unapologetically himself. We walked up the driveway, and I could already feel the weight of my parents' judgment. As we stepped inside, Mom's face went pale at the sight of Jake, her eyes widening in shock. What in the world, Eliza? She gasped, her voice barely a whisper. Dad's reaction was harsher, his words sharp as knives. Who is this and why is he dressed like a thug in our house? I took a deep breath, steadying my nerves. Mom, Dad, this is Jake. Hayes, he's the man I love. We're getting married. Their silence was deafening. 
Then Dad turned to Jake, his tone laced with disdain. Married, what do you do for a living, young man? What are your qualifications? Jake, bless him, didn't waver. I'm a welder. I took some specialized courses after high school. I work hard and I make an honest living. The look on my parents' faces was a mix of horror and disbelief. Mom looked like she might faint. A welder, Eliza. You can't be serious. Dad's voice rose, anger flaring. You expect us to give our blessing to this? To throw away your future for a, a welder? I felt my resolve harden. Yes, because he makes me happy. Isn't that what should matter? But the life you'll lead, Mom started, her voice tremulous. Will be the life I choose. I shot back, my own voice gaining strength. Dad shook his head, his decision clear. We cannot and will not support this. If you choose him, don't expect to be a part of this family. The finality in his tone broke my heart, but not my decision. Jake squeezed my hand, giving me the strength to face them. Then I choose Jake. I choose us. I choose my happiness. Mom's eyes filled with tears and Dad's jaw clenched tight. If you walk out with him, don't bother coming back, Dad said, his voice cold. Walking away from my parents' house with Jake, my heart was a mess of emotions. Pain, relief, excitement, and fear all mixed into one. The night air felt different, like each breath I took was a step further into a new life. We rode in silence for a while, the only sound the steady roar of the motorcycle beneath us. When we finally stopped at a small diner on the outskirts of town, Jake turned to me, his face serious. You sure about this, Eliza? I mean, really sure. There's no going back after tonight, he said, his eyes searching mine for any hint of doubt. I nodded, squeezing his hand tightly. I've never been more sure of anything. Being with you, this feels right. It feels like what I'm supposed to do. He smiled that reckless, charming smile that had won me over the first day we met. All right then, let's do it. Let's start our life together. Inside the diner, we found a quiet booth in the corner. The waitress brought over two coffees without asking, and we sat there planning our next steps. So what's first? I asked, stirring cream into my coffee, watching it swirl and blend. We'll need to find a place to stay, at least for a while. Then maybe look for jobs. I have some buddies who can help us get started, Jake replied, his tone practical but optimistic. It's going to be tough, isn't it? I said, more a statement than a question. The reality of what we were doing was beginning to sink in. Jake reached across the table, his hand covering mine. It might be, but we'll handle it together. Tough is nothing new for either of us, right? I couldn't help but laugh, a short, sharp burst of genuine amusement. Right together we spent hours in that diner talking and planning. Every so often, Jake would throw out an idea that sounded so wild, so free, that it made my heart jump. And maybe one day, we'll save enough to take that road trip across the country. Just you, me, and the open road. I like that, I said, allowing myself to dream bigger than I had ever dared. Riding back into the city, we began our search. The next weeks were a blur of activity. We found a small apartment on the edge of town. Nothing fancy, but it was ours. Jake found work at a local garage, and I picked up shifts at a nearby diner. Life was hard, but it was ours. We made do with what we had, and every night when we came home to each other, it felt like we had everything. Months later, we decided it was time to make it official and got married in a small, intimate ceremony. I held on to a sliver of hope that my family would show up, that they would see how happy I was and let go of their prejudices. But the chairs reserved for them remained empty, and no congratulatory messages came. Despite the sting of their absence, the day was perfect because it was ours. Over time, I grew incredibly close to Jake's mom. She welcomed me with open arms 
calling me her daughter and filling in the gaps left by my own family. Her warmth and acceptance healed some of the wounds left by my parents' rejection. Things were finally looking up for Jake and me. After he completed additional diving training and became a certified underwater welder, his income shot up to $150,000 a year. That change made a world of difference. We managed to buy a townhouse in a nice area, the kind of place I'd always dreamed about but never thought I'd actually live in. I started working as a dispatcher in Jake's company. It wasn't just a job. It felt like I was part of something important, supporting the man I loved and building our future together. On weekends, we'd escape the city on his bike, roaring through winding roads and taking in breathtaking views of nature. Those moments, with the wind in my hair and his warmth against my back, were pure bliss. Living nearby, my mother-in-law became a frequent visitor. One such afternoon, while Jake was tinkering in the garage and I was fixing us some coffee, she arrived looking a bit troubled. There's been some ugly news, she said as she settled down at the kitchen table. Something about a professor at the university involved in a harassment scandal. My heart skipped a beat. Oh, did they say who it was? I tried to keep my voice steady, threading the answer. She shook her head. No, they didn't mention a name on the radio, but you know how these things go. It's probably all over the TV by now. Nodding, I flicked on the television, tuning into the news. Sure enough, there was a report on the scandal. And as I had feared, my father's face appeared on the screen. The anchor detailed accusations against him, and I felt a cold wave of disbelief wash over me. Turning off the TV, I sat down heavily, trying to process the news. Jake came in, wiping his hands on a rag, and saw my face. What's wrong, babe? He asked, his brow furrowed in concern. I swallowed hard, my voice barely a whisper. It's my dad. He's been accused of harassing a student. Jake's expression hardened for a moment before he came over and took my hand. I'm sorry, Eliza. That's tough news. How do you want to handle this? I shook my head, not really sure of anything at the moment. I don't know. I mean, what can I even do? It's not like we're close anymore. He squeezed my hand, understanding. Whatever you need, I'm here for you. We don't have to figure it all out right now. I decided to wait and see how things unfolded before making any moves. Whatever decision I made, I knew I'd have Jake by my side, and that was the reassurance I needed to face whatever came next. Life had been peaceful until that unexpected afternoon at work when a familiar car pulled into the parking lot. I hadn't seen my parents in a long while, and the sight of them stirred up a mix of emotions I thought I had put to rest. Both of them looked dramatically changed. The scandal had taken its toll. Mom had lost a lot of weight and looked years older, while Dad appeared broken, a shadow of the stern man he once was. My mother spotted me and rushed over, arms open as if nothing had happened, as if years of distance and disapproval could be bridged in an instant. But I couldn't embrace her, not now. Instead, I stepped back and took Jake's hand, looking for strength in his presence. Eliza, it was so hard to find you, Mom said, her voice cracking with emotion. Dad, ever the gruff one, cut to the chase, his voice harsh and bitter. I was accused unfairly, you know. I went to your sister's husband for help, but that bloodsucker wanted a fortune. Your sister sided with him, and now they've kicked us out. We need your help. I stared at them, disbelief and anger swirling inside me. Help? After all these years, you show up and demand help. We have nowhere else to go. Mom's voice was desperate. They've disowned us too. We thought maybe we could stay with you. I almost laughed at the absurdity. Stay with me? After you disowned me? You made it clear I wasn't your daughter anymore. Dad's face turned red, his old temper flaring up. You owe us, Eliza, after all we've done for you. That's where you're wrong, 
I interrupted, feeling Jake squeeze my hand in support. I don't owe you anything. You threw me out because I chose my happiness over your demands. And now you want what? To just move in and pretend like we're a family. The situation was spiraling, and I could see people watching, a crowd beginning to form. Mom started to cry, her sobs loud and attracting even more attention. You're being ungrateful after everything we've done for you, she accused through her tears. I took a deep breath, my decision clear. No, Mom, I'm not ungrateful. I'm free and happy. You made your choices, and now you have to live with them. As we walked away, I heard my dad yelling, but Jake leaned over and quietly told the security team, don't let them come here again. The following months flew by, filled with love and peace. We welcomed a son, a new beginning in our growing family. My parents never came back. That day in the parking lot was the last I saw of them, and while part of me grieved for what could have been, I knew I had made the right choice for me and for my family.